in this very final video on cardiovascular disease and cardiac disease, um, I'm going to focus on valvular heart diseases, both valvular incompetence and stenosis, as well as endocarditis, and then heart muscle disease, myocarditis, and cardiomyopathy, and we'll end on a discussion of pericardial diseases. So I won't review here the um, kind of cardiac cycle and how the valves fit into that, so be sure you understand that from the cardiac physiology videos. Um, but remember, we of course have the AV valves between the atrium ventricles and then the uh, semilunar valves, the pulmonic and the aortic valves. So we can have issues on either one or all of those different valves. Um, valve disorders typically have very common features. Um, they um, usually lead chronically to some degree of heart failure and predispose a person to arrhythmia. So that's one of the reasons why we're so concerned about chronic valve disorders that are not properly uh, managed. They also, any sort of valve disorder will increase the risk of infection. And that's because bacteria can actually get set up on those valves. They can start growing, they form calcifications and whatnot, and this causes infective endocarditis. Um, typically, the valve disorders on the left side of the heart are gonna produce more symptoms obviously than on the right side because it's the left side that's maintaining systemic perfusion. Um, we hear valve disorders, uh, if we're going to hear them, on auscultation. Uh, remember with auscultation our lub dub represents the closing lub of the AV dub of the semilunar valves. Uh, murmurs will be any sound heard additionally to that. So if you hear a lub, dub, lub, dub, that's a murmur, and that indicates a valve disorder. And we can classify them based on when they occur. So remember, lub is essentially marking the beginning of systole, and then dub. So lub is closing of the AV valves, uh, dub is the closing of the semilunar valves. This is systole, and then um, between the dub and the next lub, that is uh, diastole. So we can hear murmurs either in systole or in diastole. So we're, we can determine that. And then remember, we're auscultating at four different points on the chest to give us information about the four different valves. So again, I'm not going to review that here, but um, you can, you can uh, review that and make sure you understand that. Um, the murmurs that we hear can either be physiologic, meaning they are just normal physiologic changes, or they can be pathologic. And the pathologic murmurs either indicate what's called stenosis, and that would be a narrowing of the valve, uh, valvular insufficiency or regurgitation, that would be a leaky valve, or uh, less commonly a septal defect, like an atrial septal defect that I've talked about, uh, even a ventricular one as well. These are congenital issues uh, where we have blood shunting from either the right atrium to the left atrium uh, or the right ventricle to left ventricle, and that causes characteristic uh, heart sounds as well. Um, so we classify murmurs based on their timing, their shape, their location, uh, the radiation, intensity, pitch, and quality. So all these are taken into consideration. So again, if you're not doing cardiopulmonary exams, you know, this is more just survey information for you. If you're doing these exams, you have to understand when you listen to heart sounds exactly where they're falling in the cardiac cycle and what each sound might indicate. Typically for our systolic murmurs, again, between lub and dub, uh, they can happen mid-systolic, and that would be characteristic of aortic stenosis or pulmonic stenosis, an atrial septal defect, or it happens also in a specific type of cardiomyopathy called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It can be holosystolic, in other words, through the whole of systole, and that's characteristic of mitral regurge, tricuspid regurge, or ventricular septal defect. Um, and it can also occur in late systole, and that's going to be common in a mitral valve prolapse. Our diastolic murmurs are fewer, but that can happen early, oops, should be early diastole, um, and that would be aortic regurge or pulmonic regurge or mid to late diastolic, and that would be a mitral stenosis or tricuspid stenosis, and another would be a patent ductus arteriosus, uh, remember that. So these would be um, the classic, and this is uh, kind of a picture of when these different murmurs would occur uh, between, you know, if, if they're happening in systole or diastole, and between which heart sounds. Okay, so how do we assess murmurs? Well, auscultation is going to be our first step. So if we hear a heart murmur, um, usually the next thing we're going to do in undiagnosed patients is send them for an echocardiogram. And the echo will actually be able to visualize the valves. Uh, more and more, the, the uh, echoes are becoming more portable, 
And uh, there's actually a few that are on the market now that you can actually have in your office with training. You can actually use them to visualize the valves and see if there's any valve stenosis or incompetence. Um, the most accurate assessment, though, is when they put catheters into the chambers of the heart. They can measure the pressure across valves. They can put radioactive tracers in there and take pictures. And that's cardiac catheterization. That's going to be our most accurate assessment. Um, so the treatment is really going to depend on the type of valve defect. Again, we're only going to treat the pathologic uh, uh, valve disorders. Um, and that, that might be different medications like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, or ARBs, maybe diuretics or digoxin if there's heart failure. Uh, in later disease, um, what's called a balloon valvoplasty can be performed. And that's where if you have a stenotic mitral or aortic valve, they can put a balloon in there, inflate it, and that actually breaks out the calcium and everything and opens the valve back up again. That's called a balloon valvoplasty. They can also replace the valve that way through a catheter. They can put a valve that, uh, an artificial valve in there. And there's several different types of valves. Some actually need to be replaced with open heart surgery, uh, but a human homograft would be a human valve. Um, what's good about the human valves is they, a person receiving that will not need to take anticoagulation. Uh, whenever you put a foreign body into the blood's path of the blood, like you'll see with the artificial valves, like mechanical valves, that has the potential for triggering uh, platelet activation, and uh, a person will need to be on either an antiplatelet or anticoagulant medication. Uh, so human homographs do not require anticoagulation. A pig or bovine heterograft valve, um, also there's no need for anticoagulation in those cases. And then mechanical valves, which are the, probably the easiest to place, uh, but those are going to need some degree of anticoagulation. So the different types of valves all have advantages and disadvantages, uh, but this would be for end-stage treatment of different valve disorders. So let me talk first about the most common types of stenotic valves. You can have a stenosis really in all the valves, but um, the aortic and the mitral valve are the most common sites of stenosis. Um, so what happens again in stenosis is the valve gets narrowed and um, basically it also doesn't close effectively. So if you look at a normal uh, aortic valve, for example, here it is in the open position, here it is in the closed position. With stenosis, it doesn't fully open. So that's going to decrease cardiac output, but it's also going to uh, increase the pressure with which the left ventricle has to push against. And over time, that's going to cause the left ventricle to hypertrophy. Um, and uh, here's the closed valve. It doesn't close entirely, so you get some backflow and regurgitation into the ventricle, which worsens the whole situation. This will create a murmur on systole. So again, in systole, the blood is being pushed from the left ventricle through the aortic valve, so you can hear it on systole. Uh, systolic murmur, and um, again, it's gonna put pressure overload on the left ventricle. It's common, uh, about 2% of people over the age of 65 have aortic stenosis. 3% over 75 and 4% over 85. Now, by far, the majority of these cases are mild and don't need any additional treatment. Um, but when they get severe enough, they're going to need more intervention. The causes can be congenital. Uh, the, the valve doesn't form uh, appropriately, and so that'll be detected usually early in life. Uh, it can be from uh, aortic stenosis from calcium deposits related to especially atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Uh, it could be from a bicuspid aortic valve. Now, I said that in the cardiac physiology videos that aortic valves are typically tricuspid. Uh, a percentage of the population has a bicuspid valve, which uh, usually doesn't result in any problems in early life, but it predisposes a person later in life to developing aortic stenosis. Uh, so this is another common congenital abnormality. And then if you've had rheumatic fever, and this is from a uh, streptococcal infection, um, so this is, again, why we are worried about streptococcal pharyngitis, uh, strep throat. You know, if that infection spreads, it can, it can spread to the heart and uh, it can actually damage the aortic valve and that can predispose a person to aortic stenosis. Uh, the presentation, usually patients are asymptomatic for years, uh, but once they're asymptomatic, they typically develop some degree of angina and then they start getting syncope, especially on exertion and that progresses into heart failure. So that's the typical progression of aortic stenosis. And uh, this progression occurs within five years, if not corrected. So 
we try to, once we identify this, get patients to treatment very quickly. On physical exam, we actually hear the S2 sound will be split. Remember, the aortic valve is closing, uh, and that is the uh, one of the sounds we hear in S2 is the closing of the aortic valve. Uh, the pulmonic valve also closes at the same time, but if they don't close at the same rate and if the aortic valve is stenosed a little bit, we're going to hear a split S2. Uh, we're going to hear a systolic murmur, and that's going to radiate up to the carotid arteries. Uh, we might even feel the chest vibrate on systole. That's called the precordial thrill. And then uh, what's called the pulsus parvus et tardis, which is a weak uh, delayed carotid upstroke pulse. Um, so this would all be indicating that the blood is just not exiting the left ventricle adequately in systole. The outcomes would be left ventricular hypertrophy and heart failure eventually. And so our workup would be a chest x-ray that might show a calcific aortic valve in large left ventricle, ECG, echocardiogram, and then some degree of cardiac catheterization. That's going to be the definitive test to use before any surgery might be recommended. Um, medical treatment here in terms of beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, blood pressure reduction has a pretty limited role. Uh, so the main treatments are uh, when it gets bad enough to do any degree of uh, balloon valvoplasty or the aortic valve replacement, which is the treatment of choice. Um, I don't know of any studies with adjunctive therapies, herbal therapy, acupuncture, whatnot, at preventing the progression of aortic stenosis, but that would be, uh, if you work with a lot of cardiovascular patients, an interesting case series maybe to write up if you have success with that. Um, the next stenotic condition would be mitral stenosis, and this is heard in diastole. So basically, the mitral valve isn't fully relaxing. During diastole, as the blood rushes from the left atrium to the left ventricle, and so it causes a murmur in diastole. And so the left ventricle will not full, fill adequately. The most common cause, nearly all cases, is from rheumatic fever. And this again is from streptococcal upper respiratory tract infections. And um, so this is again, one of the indicators why we, we take strep throat seriously to prevent this. This used to be very common in the early 1900s. We see a lot less of it now, but there still are cases that pop up here and there. Um, most common currently, not in the U.S., but in Africa, the Middle East, and Far East is where we, we still see a lot of cases uh, because of probably just inadequate medical care in some of those places. Um, so that is uh, the most common reason for mitral valve stenosis. And the symptoms can range from just mild, uh, to, from asymptomatic to dyspnea, orthopnea, uh, can be infective endocarditis, and then arrhythmias, arrhythmias might develop from that as well. Um, so typically in the physical exam, we hear a diastolic murmur uh, and with what's called an opening snap. So at the beginning of diastole, so we hear lub, dub, and right after dub, you hear this like snapping sound. And then you hear a mid-diastolic murmur that's loudest at the apex of the heart. Um, and then um, yeah, you might see some degree of pulmonary edema as blood begins to back up in the left side of the heart. It backs up into the lungs. Um, outcomes would be pulmonary hypertension, right heart failure, because you're having increased uh, pulmonary uh, pressure, uh, pressure in the pulmonary tree, so the right heart has to pump more strongly against that, atrial fibrillation, and left atrial dilation. Uh, the assessment would be through ECG, echo, and then cardiac catheterization again. And the treatments here, medically, there is a role for beta blockers, uh, digoxin, but again, balloon valvoplasty and mitral valve replacement would be options there as well. So that's the, the most common types of stenotic diseases. You can have pulmonic stenosis as well, but it's going to be less uh, symptomatic. But the kind of outcomes and whatnot are going to be similar, and the treatments will be similar as well. Next, I'll look at the two most common types of, valve, types of valve insufficiency, so aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation. Um, so aortic regurgitation, so the aortic valve is not patent. It does not close adequately. So basically on diastole, when the heart relaxes, the blood should be rushing from the left atrium to the left ventricle through the mitral valve. But it also, because the aortic valve didn't close all the way, uh, it's staying open a bit. We have blood rushing from the aorta back into the left ventricle. So here we hear a diastolic murmur and we have uh, aortic insufficiency. Um, so this again is from a leaking aortic valve. 
blood's going to flow from the aorta to the left ventricle during diastole. And this usually progresses to some degree of left heart failure. Um, the causes can be either acute or chronic. So acutely, it could be from infective endocarditis or aortic dissection. We've already talked about that one, or, or maybe a, a massive chest trauma. That can actually induce uh, the aortic incompetence. It could also be from valve malformations, rheumatic fever, connective tissue disorders. Um, acutely, the uh, presentation would be rapid pulmonary congestion because uh, of all the blood backing up on the left side of the heart. Uh, cardiogenic shock because of decreased cardiac output. We don't have enough perfusion and severe dyspnea. Uh, chronically, it might slowly progress to heart failure. And then we start to see all the classic signs of heart failure like dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, and so forth. Physical exam, we'd see uh, in early diastole, a high-pitched blowing murmur. Uh, has sort of a it has a crescendo, decrescendo kind of uh, aspect to it. And uh, it's heard most loudly at the left third interspace. Um, and uh, we'd also hear potentially an S3 heart sound after, you know, lub dub, we'd hear almost like a second dub. So lub dub dub. Um, and that uh, would indicate left ventricular dysfunction, as we talked about before. There's also usually a very wide pulse pressure, so between systolic and diastolic pressures, and that's because um, we're having this sort of erratic uh, output and, and uh, backflowing through that aortic valve. So we can get what's called a Corrigan water hammer pulse. That's a large pulse that collapses in diastole. The Mousset sign, the head actually bobs with the heartbeat. And then Quinky sign, that's the capillary beds and the nails, uh, can be seen to pulsate actually from the wide pulse pressure. So those are just some classic findings uh, with, in this case, uh, aortic regurg. Uh, again, our assessment's gonna be you know, with uh, ECG, echo, cardiac catheterization. Treatment here would be usually with vasodilators uh, like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, with uh, calcium channel blockers or hydralazine. And um, that is basically going to be to try to decrease the afterload um, so that less blood regurgitates back into the left ventricle. And then aortic valve replacement would be for very severe cases. So that's aortic regurg. And then finally, mitral regurg, this would be a systolic murmur. So in systole, as the left ventricle contracts, blood rushes from the left ventricle to the left atrium. And um, this is pretty common. Um, a lot of people have this, and for most people, it's pretty mild. It's usually less than 20% regurgitation, so they're pretty much asymptomatic. But you can hear it. It's pretty a pretty loud murmur uh, during systole. Moderate would be between 20 and 40% regurg. Moderate to severe, up to 60% regurg, and severe would be over 60% regurg. And now we're starting to get very symptomatic because of decreased uh, cardiac output. Um, very commonly occurs after post-MI with, with uh, necrosis of the papillary muscles and rupture of the cordy tendony, and that can cause cardiogenic shock uh, in infective endocarditis, in this case from Staph aureus, um, mitral valve prolapse. So that's where the cordy tendony gets stretched. They don't really hold the mitral valve closed adequately, so it regurges. Um, so that's, we can say it's a variant of mitral regurgitation, but that's the most common cause. And that's more common in females. We think that estrogens might have something to do with that, making the ligaments more lax there and so forth. Uh, again, the majority of these cases are mild. They, they're not going to need any treatment and they're, they're pretty much asymptomatic. I've known people with mitral valve prolapses, uh, women that are runners and they get very little symptoms. Sometimes with extreme exertion, they might get a little symptomatic but in most cases, it's uh, not gonna be a problem. Uh, rheumatic heart disease, cardiomyopathies, uh, endocarditis, and then connective tissue disorders like Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos will predispose people to mitral regurgitation. Um, presentation will be eventually left ventricular failure in the severe cases, and that would be uh, dyspnea orthopnea. So if we have over 60% regurg, we get a dilated left atrium due to all the volume increasing in there. Um, and then uh, we might see some pulmonary hypertension as the blood backs up in the pulmonary tree, and then right heart failure can develop over time as well. Uh, and then a person's more susceptible to atrial fibrillation. So again, the valve disorders can predispose you to the arrhythmias. We'd hear on physical exam a holosystolic murmur. This would radiate actually to the axilla, 
you can often hear this in more, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, severe ones, but even in mild uh, prolapses or regurgitation, you might hear it uh, without a stethoscope. Or just, you know, if you're close to the patient, you might actually hear this. And sometimes you hear like a little click in mid-systole. And that's going to be very common in the mitral valve prolapse. So in the middle of systole, you hear the lub-dub. You hear lub-dub, lub-dub. But you hear this lub-thick-dub. I can't do it. Lub, and then you hear click, and then and then dub. And that's a typical uh, sign of a mitral valve prolapse. And that's going to be increased if you have the patient valsalva. They hold their breath. They bear down. Uh, that will actually uh, accentuate the mitral valve prolapse. And we might hear an S3 heart sound again. The assessment, same thing, ECG. Here we might find, again, left ventricular hypertrophy with left atrial enlargement. That can be determined by a 12-lead ECG. Uh, chest X-ray, echocardiogram, cardiac catheterization. Again, uh, vasodilators like ACE inhibitors, hydralazine. Um, and then anticoagulants here might be indicated for the severe, uh, more than 60% regurg because of the turbulence, again, increased risk of thrombi and embolization. And typically, um, you know, and uh, that's going to often be associated with the AFib. So when patients have AFib with this, they're definitely going to need anticoagulation like warfarin or anoke novel oral anticoagulant. And then surgery would be mitral valve replacement. You can actually do a, they can do a repair or a replacement. So that's a very common uh, murmur. Um, again, if you're more in adjunctive care settings and you just happen to hear a murmur uh, and it hasn't been diagnosed, uh, you might want to have the patient get the ECG and the echocardiogram, get a further workup to be sure that this is not something that needs to be addressed more urgently medically. Um, and, uh, you know, once that's been, you know, if they have a benign murmur, if they just have a mild mitral regurge, then we just sort of monitor over time to make sure they don't progress with their symptoms. So that's, uh, that's the summary of the major types of valvular heart disease, both in the stenotic and the insufficiency type diseases. Now, one last valvular disease that's important to know is infective endocarditis. I've mentioned this a few times. This is an infection on the inner surface of the heart, typically the valves. Um, and there's actually a non-infective form associated with things like cancer, hypercoagulable states, and autoimmune disease like lupus. But most commonly, it's due to infection. And typically, it's bacterial. Rarely, it can be fungal, especially in immunocompromised patients. Um, and uh, most typically, it's either staph or strep. And they are generally commensal bacteria on the gums and the skin or whatnot. We're not sure what predisposes you, probably some weakening in the immune response, uh, to now having the bacteria gain the upper hand and they start growing. They get into the blood. The bacteria from the gums in particular are a concern. And uh, they get into the blood, and uh, like after a dental procedure, and then they can actually set up shop on the inner surface of the heart, especially around the valves. Um, and they can cause vegetations and growths on the valves. Uh, the mitral valve is the, the valve, as we mentioned, most commonly affected. And um, the tricuspid valve can also be affected on the right side of the heart, but typically this is associated with IV drug use. Um, the uh, inserting the uh, the uh, needle into the skin introduces bacteria. They get into the venous system, and then it goes to the right side of the heart and sets up infection on the tricuspid valve. The, once the vegetations grow, that causes local turbulence, and that can increase the risk for thrombi, and again, they can embolize to the brain. Um, so we usually classify infective endocarditis as either acute or chronic. Um, acutely, this would be caused usually by staph aureus um, and uh, bacteria, and uh, usually occurs on a normal heart valve. Um, unfortunately, if not treated appropriately, this can actually be fatal within six weeks. Um, so this is where we have a sense of urgency around bacterial endocarditis. Subacutely, we see less virulent organisms like streptviridans and pterococcus. Usually this occurs in people with damaged heart valves or more susceptible to it. And if untreated, it takes usually longer than six weeks to cause death. Uh, but the mortality rate overall for infective endocarditis can be up to 25%. Um, even in treated cases, uh, in nearly all untreated cases, are almost always fatal. So this is one of those where we definitely need patients to receive adequate treatment. 
Now the risk factors would be having underlying valvular heart disease, uh, rheumatic fever, congenital heart disease, having artificial valves, patients that receive hemodialysis, uh, IV drug users, uh, dental procedures like tooth extraction, uh, electronic pacemakers. Now this is actually listed in the, in the WHO guidelines and whatnot as one of the concerns of acupuncture. Uh, you are you know, introducing needles into the skin that could potentially introduce bacteria. I think the number of cases are extremely low and in every case it was associated with using poor clean needle technique. So using unsterilized needles and things like that. So uh, I, I think the incidence in uh, patients with, you know, get acupuncture with clean needle technique, it's probably almost zero. Um, but this is something to think about for patients with underlying valvular disease. They're going to be at higher risk uh, for potential infection. That's not to say that we need to give all these patients antibiotics or anything before acupuncture. Uh, we used to, uh, it was often recommended to give antibiotic prophylaxis uh, with patients um, uh, with underlying valve disorders that are undergoing dental procedures. They've just be put on a round of antibiotics prophylactically. Uh, we now have evidence showing that that's probably not necessary. But I still have patients that call me going to the dentist and they want a round of antibiotics and you know I explain this to them and they don't want to hear it and so I end up having to prescribe the antibiotics. But that's um, kind of uh, what the new data suggests is we don't really don't need to do the antibiotic prophylaxis. What are the presentations, the clinical signs of this? Well, any sign of generalized, um, you know, fever, malaise, and so forth. Uh, but we might hear now a heart murmur uh, either appear out of the blue or an underlying murmur get worse. Um, weight loss, coughing, night sweats, might notice the spleen gets enlarged, and that's because the spleen is working over time uh, as an immune organ to work with the infection. Um, there can be vascular issues like septic embolism, so that can create stroke or gangrene in the fingers, so that's creating little thrombi that go out and lodge in your peripheral capillary beds. Uh, Janeway lesions, these are painless hemorrhagic lesions of the palms or the soles, so that's an interesting one. So a patient presenting with these general symptoms, they suddenly get these weird uh, little uh, discolorations um, on their palms and soles that aren't painful. That's a Janeway lesion, and that's a pretty classic underlying sign of infective endocarditis. Uh, intracranial hemorrhages, these are the more severe outcomes. Conjunctival hemorrhage, they start bleeding into the eye. Um, splinter hemorrhages in the nail beds, kidney infarcts and spleen infarcts. Um, and then there can be immunologic uh, consequences and that would be a decrease in kidney function, glomerulonephritis, they start spilling proteins. Osler's nose are painful. Uh, erythema, the little nodes that form in the skin on the hands and feet, so different than the Janeway lesions. Roth spots on the retina, and then positive serum rheumatoid factors. So you'd see the autoimmune response kicking up and uh, as a result of this. So these are all potential uh, clinical presentations. You don't need to memorize all those, but you here have a person that um, you know presents with this sort of unexplained infection. And if you hear any new or worsening murmur, if you listen with the stethoscope, uh, and so forth, then this is the kind of, this is a patient that needs further workup to, to rule out infective endocarditis. Um, if the assessment is going to be using what's called the Duke criteria, and I won't list that here. You can look up online what that includes, but there's several history and uh, other findings that are included in that. Uh, going to do usually a transthoracic echocardiogram, different labs that will indicate infection like a CBC, and then uh, ESR, CRP, have very low specificity, but indicate generalized inflammation. And then blood cultures might be done. Uh, typically, these patients will need, <clears throat> need IV antibiotics, pretty heavy hitting antibiotics like vancomycin, uh, usually for two weeks. And then after that, oral antibiotics for up to six weeks. So pretty intensive antimicrobial therapy for these patients. Uh, surgery might be needed to actually debreed the infected material and uh, maybe even replace the valve if it's bad enough. Um, so that's infective endocarditis. Just keep that in mind. Uh, very rare that you're going to see this, uh, but it's one of those where if a patient doesn't receive adequate treatment, it can be or usually is fatal. Next, I want to say a few words about cardiomyopathies. These are a group of diseases that affect the heart muscle. Uh, they're usually asymptomatic in the early stages, but they can progress over time to heart failure, arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death. Um, I have a relative who actually 
very good shape. Um, they used to be really good shape, soccer player, whatnot. Started drinking a little too much beer. And uh, so when I would, he would come visit, you know, we'd just go up and maybe hike up a hill or something and he'd be out of breath very quickly. Thought it was just because he was out of shape. And um, he started having syncopal episodes, started passing out. Um, and so he went for a workup and they actually um, diagnosed an underlying cardiomyopathy. Um, and so that's typically, or that's commonly how it might present in adults. Um, it is actually one of the possible causes of sudden cardiac death in apparently healthy people. So this is where you see, you know, in the news, some athlete, a uh, basketball player, for example, suddenly drops dead uh, on the basketball court during practice. And uh, when they, you know, do autopsy or they, they look further into that, they find that that person actually had an underlying cardiomyopathy, which predisposed them to an arrhythmia. And so they developed probably ventricular fibrillation, went into uh, asystole. Uh, there's many causes, many types, and we usually classify cardiomyopathy as either primary cardiomyopathy, and these are intrinsic diseases of the cardiac muscle, typically of unknown origin, although we suspect a lot of them have genetic components, and that would include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that's what my relative was diagnosed with, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and ion channelopathies. So these would all be different types of genetic primary cardiomyopathies. But the first three are the most uh, discussed, and I'll talk about those in the next slide here. There can be acquired primary cardiomyopathies, and the most common one here would be the stress cardiomyopathy, also known as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, or broken heart syndrome. Um, so what happens here is there's a massive outflow of catecholamines and stress hormones, and it actually causes uh, a metabolic change in the cardiac uh, muscle wall, and it causes the left ventricle to dilate into this like uh, shape of a Japanese crab pot, and that's uh, what the Takotsubo refers to. And um, that one then results in temporary uh, decrease of cardiac output. It's sort of like a version of heart failure. The good thing about the stress cardiomyopathy is it usually resolves fairly quickly and the left ventricle goes back to normal function. Uh, myocarditis um, could also cause cardiomyopathy and ischemic cardiomyopathy having decreased uh, blood flow to the uh, cardiac muscle wall. The importance about cardiomyopathy is that it's different, uh, or distinguishing feature is it's different from any coronary artery disease. So in patients with cardiomyopathy usually have no uh, coronary artery disease. And um, so that's why we, we think it's a problem of the heart muscle itself, not of the blood flow to the heart, like a blocked coronary artery. A secondary cardiomyopathy would be caused by conditions extrinsic to the heart. So that could be metabolic, like hemochromatosis, where you have an iron overload, and that iron accumulates in the heart muscle and causes damage. Endocrine disorders like type 2 diabetes, hypertension, acromegaly, which is actually from excess growth hormone, um, and then uh, neuromuscular causes like muscular dystrophy, et cetera, can all cause cardiomyopathy as well. In terms of the primary cardiomyopathies, if this is a normal heart muscle, dilated cardiomyopathy, the left ventricle becomes very dilated, the wall becomes very thin. Um, in hypertrophic, the wall becomes very thick. So you get a thickened left ventricular wall. And then restrictive, basically the wall becomes less compliant. So it does not fill. We get a diastolic dysfunction. It doesn't fill in diastole. So that is the, the different types of primary cardiomyopathy there. The assessment for cardiomyopathy is our typical cardiovascular assessment, history, ECG, physical exam. Uh, cardiac stress test to rule out, you know, any ischemic issues that might be contributing to uh, the dysfunction in the heart muscle. An echocardiogram, chest x-ray to look for enlargement. Cardiac MRI is very helpful for characterizing any changes in the ventricular size and shape. Cardiac catheterization and then potentially genetic testing. And for patients that have been diagnosed with a primary cardiomyopathy, usually it's a good idea that all of their family all of their offspring, their, their sons and daughters, get uh, genetically tested to be sure that they don't have an increased risk of a cardiomyopathy themselves. Um, the treatment really depends on the type of cardiomyopathy and the symptoms. Um, usually the damage has already occurred, and so the care is mostly supportive. Um, so, for example, decreasing alcohol, uh, decreasing all the cardiac risk factors, uh, medications that might decrease like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers to reduce the risk of arrhythmia and heart failure. 
Uh, pacemakers, implantable defibrillators in very severe cases might be needed, ablation for recurring arrhythmias, and then surgery, for example, left ventricular assist devices and potentially even heart transplant uh, in uh, more severe degenerative cases. The complications would be increased thrombus formation and emboli, uh, heart murmurs and valve defects, arrhythmias again, heart failure, and potentially cardiac arrest from VFib. Now, I just want to say a few words about heart transplant here. We haven't talked about that yet, but um, heart transplant is usually performed on patients with end-stage um, heart failure or severe coronary artery disease. Um, the most common procedure is to take the heart and sometimes both lungs from a recently deceased donor and then implant that into the patient. There's some very interesting uh, follow-up findings with that. A lot of the recipients curiously receive a lot of the memories uh, and even uh, personality traits of the donors. And there's been some very interesting literature around that showing us that things like memory and consciousness are not just in the brain, that all the organs, as we well know in traditional medicines, participate in that. Um, the patient's own heart is either removed and replaced, that's called the orthotopic procedure, or less commonly, the heart is left in place to support the donor heart. So if there's still some function left, maybe the donor, uh, it will be left in place. So you have two hearts. Um, about, there's about 3,500 heart transplants performed a year worldwide, and about half of those are done in the U.S. As you can imagine, this is a very high intensity, uh, high cost uh, uh, procedure. And um, so, you know, we do a lot of those expensive, fancy procedures in the U.S., so that's why half of them are done here. Uh, the post-operation survival rate is around 15 years, so it used to be very short. Now, with current interventions and medications, is up to 15 years. Um, now, the autonomic nerves are severed in the procedure, but interestingly, over time, there's evidence that the sympathetic nerves, at least, possibly the vagal nerves, regrow into the, new, into the uh, recipient heart and uh, that can restore some autonomic tone. Um, patients, though, will need to be on immunosuppressive drug therapy for life, and that's because this is foreign tissue, the immune system will reject it unless the immune system is suppressed. So they're gonna be much, at much higher risk now of uh, infection and so forth. Um, and uh, what can happen is that if there are a lot of cardiovascular risk factors in that patient, the transplanted heart might actually develop atherosclerosis over time in the coronary arteries. So this is an interesting finding there. Uh, but again, the average sort of survival rate is around 15 years with heart transplant. So again, this is reserved for end stage uh, heart failure, basically. I just wanna say a few words about the three most common types of cardiomyopathy. Uh, so dilated or congestive cardiomyopathy, this is results in progressive cardiac hypertrophy. Uh, dilation and low ejection fraction. So the ventricles really look uh, large, but sort of uh, more, uh, you know, the walls are thinner actually, and it looks kind of ballooned out. Um, usually the cause is unknown. So we say it's idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, and uh, this is actually the leading reason for cardiac transplantation. So not, not uh, coronary artery disease or hypertensive heart disease is actually from this, uh, unknown origin, um, you know, dilated cardiomyopathy. The median age of presentation is around 50, but it can be younger. Uh, and the coronary arteries, again, are free from any significant disease. So there's no ischemic heart disease here. And uh, this results in an impaired inability of the left ventricle to contract. So again, the most common causes are unknown. We do know some secondary causes. So chronic hypertension, genetics, alcohol, different drugs, uh, endocrinopathies like hyperthyroidism, uh, pheochromocytomas, these are adrenal medulla, adrenaline secreting uh, tumors, infections, um, and then nutritional disorders, especially severe vitamin B1 deficiency, which is very rare in the US, but that can cause what's called wet beriberi. It causes heart failure and uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So the treatment would be under, uh, addressing any, any secondary causes if known. Uh, but basically, it's the same kind of treatment as for heart failure. So beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, digoxin. In this case, uh, unlike uh, some heart failure, the calcium channel blockers would be contraindicated. Um, anticoagulation, especially if there's any AFib. Uh, and then maybe uh, patients would receive an implantable cardiac defibrillator 
if the ejection fraction is very low, under 35%. But the prognosis, unfortunately, here is very poor. Uh, without transplantation, only 50, 50 to 60% of patients survive two years from the point of diagnosis. Uh, so this is one of the more severe forms of cardiomyopathy that is important to know about. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, this is what my relative was diagnosed with, uh, it's also known as obstructive cardiomyopathy. Um, there is a congenital form, the most common, it's called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, HOCM. And uh, what happens here is the left ventricle cannot relax fully and can't fill fully, so we get diastolic dysfunction. And the ventricular wall looks very thickened, as we saw on that previous slide, and that leads to left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and decreased blood ejection. Uh, so decrease blood injection. Uh, patients can be asymptomatic or they can present with some degree of lightheadedness, dyspnea on exertion, uh, even syncope, um, and, and more rarely sudden cardiac death. The causes we think are genetic in over 50% of patients. Uh, it affects uh, about one in 500 people. The incidence is equal in males and females, usually presents in earlier life in teens and young adults. And it's actually the leading cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes from arrhythmias and so forth. Uh, medications may be used for symptom management like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers again, um, and uh, uh, sodium channel blockers very rarely. Um, surgery might be needed in more severe cases. Um, you know, we can do uh, different types of things like uh, septal myectomy. Um, I won't get into the details there. That's actually uh, interfering with the ventricular septum. Um, maybe pacemaker placement and even mitral valve prolapse might, or uh, replacement might be needed. Uh, the prognosis, most cases are usually relatively mild and um, they don't need any treatment, just kind of monitoring. Uh, patients have a normal life expectancy. Um, the annual mortality rate, especially in the more severe cases, can be up to 1%, so much less than the dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, patients should really avoid really intense athletic competition and training uh, so that they don't potentially induce a fatal cardiac arrhythmia. Um, so that's hypertrophic or obstructive cardiomyopathy. The least common, I'll just mention briefly, is called restrictive cardiomyopathy, and this results in a stiff, non-compliant ventricle uh, that incompletely fills in diastole again. Um, there's no significant diastolic function, so a patient maintains uh, normal or near normal ejection fraction. The most common causes would be things like uh, hemochromatosis again, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, these are what are called infiltrated diseases, um, any sort of scarring or fibrosis secondary to radiation. Uh, worldwide, there is um, this causes uh, a condition uh, of unknown origin, it's called endomyocardial fibrosis happens in children. We think there might be a pathogen related to this that's been not, not been identified, but that would cause restrictive cardiomyopathy. The treatment is pretty much palliative, um, maybe some of the medications we discussed, and eventually, if necessary, cardiac transplantation or left ventricular cyst device. So that would be the three major types of primary cardiomyopathy. It's just important to know, keep that in mind. Again, this is not related to coronary artery disease or anything like that. Um, and uh, in the case of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, fairly common, um, and, um, but again, most cases are mild and uh, don't result uh, in, in patients have a normal life expectancy. Finally, there's a variant of cardiomyopathy that's called inflammatory cardiomyopathy or myocarditis. Uh, this is inflammation of the heart muscle. The heart muscle becomes infiltrated with lymphocytes and macrophages, indicating that the immune system is responding to some threat. Um, this happens most commonly in younger males. It can be asymptomatic, but patients might have generalized signs and symptoms of infection like fever, fatigue, and so forth. Um, and usually with cardiac symptoms like chest pain, exercise intolerance, pericarditis, or arrhythmia. Um, this can result in more severe cases in heart failure due to dilated cardiomyopathy or cardiac arrest. Uh, the most common agents we think induce uh, myocarditis would be viruses like coxsackievirus, parovirus, B12, human herpes virus type 6. Um, different bacteria can be involved like Lyme disease here again plays a role. Uh, there can be autoimmune causes like lupus different medications, uh, specifically certain antipsychotics like clozapine, 
are associated with myocarditis chemotherapy. That can be an unfortunate outcome for some patients with chemo. Different toxins, alcohol, arsenic. Interestingly, some snake venoms actually induce myocarditis. Uh, heavy metals, copper, iron, electric shock radiation, and in some cases are idiopathic. So the heart muscle becomes inflamed. And here we'd actually do uh, assessments of general inflammation, ESR, CRP. Uh, cardiac enzymes might be elevated, showing uh, spilling of, uh, you know, the cardiac muscle components. This uh, is not due to an MI in this case, it's due to the inflammation. Uh, maybe viral panels, ECG, would there be very specific findings with T-wave inversions and weird ST segment elevations? Uh, echocardiogram, cardiac MRI, and heart biopsy would be the gold standard. You can actually take a biopsy of heart tissue. The treatment depends on the severity and the cause, uh, and usually the treatment is supportive. So maybe doing our common um, medications given in heart failure, cortical steroids to decrease inflammation, IV immunoglobulin used to be given to try to fight any viruses or whatnot. There's no evidence currently of benefit, so that's not typically recommended anymore. Um, and then uh, the defibrillators and then potentially heart transplant in these patients. So that's myocarditis. Just put that on there so you understand that one additional thing that can happen is the heart muscle can become inflamed. Now, in the last slide, I'll move into pericardial diseases, but one question you might ask is why are there no cancers of the heart muscle? And that's very interesting. The, the primary cancers of the heart are very rare. And, um, and we can think that, again, in cancer, this is a condition where your cells are overgrowing because the normal restraining forces, the immune forces, but also the forces of warmth and a more functional sense, your shen, are, have withdrawn from those tissues. Well, the cardiac system, the heart and the blood vessels, uh, that is where the shen is really seated. So we can say that tumor formation there is gonna be very rare because the shen is constantly, the spirit activities, the warmth activities are constantly active there. So that could be one explanation for why primary cancers of the heart are very rare. The very last condition we'll cover here is pericarditis, which can be either acute or chronic. Um, basically, this is, uh, in both cases, acute and chronic inflammation of the pericardial sac. Um, the acute pericarditis is more symptomatic and more concerning but because it can compromise immediately cardiac output by causing tamponade. So basically, it can cause pleural, uh, pericardial effusion. As the fluid builds up around the heart, the outer layer, the fibrous pericardium, prevents further expansion outward of that fluid. So it all compresses the heart and that is going to uh, decrease the ability of the heart to properly contract. Um, most causes of acute pericarditis are idiopathic, we don't know, um, but it can be a viral infection, TB, again, uh, autoimmune like lupus, collagen vascular diseases, renal failure, uh, drugs, radiation, tumors, metastatic tumors to the heart, and it can happen over an MI. I mentioned in a few days to weeks following an MI, one of the complications is what's called Dressler's syndrome, and that's where the immune system goes in to clean up things, and uh, that can result in acute pericarditis. The presentation typically involves some degree of pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea cough, maybe a slight fever. Usually the pulse slows down to under 100. Uh, chest pain is worse leaning forward or laying down or on inspiration, and uh, we'd hear on auscultation a pericardial friction rub. It sounds like sand, the heart is beating against sandpaper. Uh, and maybe increased JVD, indicating a uh, backup of blood in the uh, venous system. And then a pulsus paradoxus, which is a decrease in systolic blood pressure, uh, more than 10 millimeters of mercury on inspiration. These would all be classic findings of acute pericarditis. So the assessment would be chest X-ray, ECG, echo, um, and the ECG would have very specific findings on ST segments and PR segments, as well as T-wave inversions, and then the echocardium might reveal pericardial thickening. Uh, the treatment usually is to under, address the underlying causes, but patients will often get either corticosteroids or immunosuppressants in, uh, if there's increased uric acid because the kidneys are failing, maybe dialysis. Um, and then uh, after MI, to prevent this, they usually give aspirin and they avoid the corticosteroids. Uh, the aspirin is usually enough to prevent this from happening. And then in viral cases, they give aspirin, 
uh, another abbreviation for aspirin is amine, um, acetyl salicylic acid, ASA, or NSAIDs. Uh, the complications would be cardiac tamponade, heart failure, arrhythmia, and then potentially MI and unstable angina. So definitely severe, potentially severe complications with uh, acute pericarditis. Chronically, we don't get the um, uh, classic issues. We get more, I'll just jump down here to chronic and I'll come back to cardiac tamponade, is uh, more constricted pericarditis. So the chronic inflammation leads to fibrous scarring of the pericardium. And that leads to thickening and rigidity of the pericardium um, and basically obliteration of the pericardial cavity. There's a lot of cases, again, most commonly it's idiopathic. We're not sure why this happens. And the treatment is to address the underlying cause. Uh, usually some diuretics are given, maybe a pericardioectomy where they can actually surgically uh, remove some of the tension on the pericardium that way. Now, anytime the pericardium gets constricted, we can get this, peri this cardiac tamponade, and that's, again, excess fluid in the pericardial sac, and that compresses the heart, that decreases ventricular filling, and that'll decrease uh, cardiac output. Um, the rate of fluid formation is actually more important than the size. Some, some people can have a lot of fluid around the heart, but if it formed over weeks or months, that's going to be less symptomatic than someone where that developed over 24 hours. Um, it can present with any degree of cardiac output, uh, including shock and even death. Um, and um, it has causes, again, can be from pericarditis, either acute or chronic, mostly acute. Can also occur from malignancy, lupus, tuberculosis, trauma, so stab wounds to the chest, uh, where we get actually fluid that builds up in the pericardial sac. Um, that can cause cardiac tamponade. It can also happen after MIs. Uh, the treatment for this urgently is pericardial synthesis, and that's where they can put a needle into the pericardial sac and drain off the fluid, and that removes the pressure from the heart. So there is a uh, classic uh, three findings that we see in cardiac tamponade. It's called Beck's triad, so hypotension, jugular venous distension, and the muffled heart sounds. Uh, again, this would be different from a tension pneumothorax where we'd actually hear no breath sounds. So if you listen with the stethoscope um, and then a very uh, interesting electrical rhythm on the ECG. So that's pericardial tamponade. Again, the treatment for that urgently is pericardial synthesis. Okay, so that's acute and chronic pericarditis. And that's a wrap for cardiac diseases and all the disorders of the cardiovascular system that are important to know about in more general primary care kind of settings. Um, so that finishes it up for the cardiovascular block.